thanks again. Well, thanks a lot for the introduction and invitation, Lorenzo. Today, I'm going to be introducing a new threat model and method for attacking deep reinforcement learning policies. Our attack causes otherwise highly capable policies to fail in the presence of an adversarial agent, even though the adversary's behavior is seemingly random and uncoordinated. Uh, this is joint work from my colleagues at Berkeley, Michael Dennis, Katie Wilde, Neil Kant, Sergey Levin, and Stuart Russell. Uh, since this is like relatively small group, if you've got any questions, uh, please just unmute yourself and interrupt me. If I don't hear you immediately, just keep talking until I do notice. Uh, that's not rude. It's just, I think, the easiest thing to do uh, with Zoom. So I'm sure we've all seen adversarial examples such as these before, where an attacker adds a small amount of carefully crafted noise to a clean sorry, image. Sorry, I don't see yeah. your screen. Oh, uh, sorry. That's, uh, problem. That's, a, that's a good point. Uh, <laughs> let me show, show it uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. I Great. Should. Thank you. OK, so I'm sure, yeah. Uh, talking to a computer vision group, so I'm sure these are very familiar to you. And these so-called LP norm attacks, uh, where the norm is constrained to lie in a small ball under some norm, are they kind of very theoretically tractable attacks. Uh, they give us some really useful insights into the security and robustness of ML systems. But it's kind of not all there is to adversarial examples, especially when we go outside of computer vision. And um, so I'm going to follow good Ian Goodfellow in viewing adversarial examples uh, much more broadly as any input that is intentionally designed to cause a model to make a mistake. So there are many ways in which an attacker could generate an adversarial example. Uh, for example, they could rotate clean images. And this won't change the true label of most objects. But it does change the image class size output in many cases. So here, a revolver turns into a mouse trap with just a 30 degree rotation. And this is especially concerning because rotations occur all of the time in real data sets, even in the absence of any adversary. You could also, if you wanted, remove any restrictions on the attacker, other than that humans can still unambiguously recognize the image. So Tom Brown and others are running a challenge to build a model that can reliably distinguish a bird from a bicycle. This sounds like it should be easy, but the attacker can construct images by any technique, including taking photographs, using 3D rendering software, or sampling from a generative model. So far, we've just discussed supervised learning. So what about reinforcement learning or RL? Unsurprisingly, reinforcement learning policies are also vulnerable to adversarial examples in their observations. Most pro work, such as that by Santi Wang and others, and Jenny Coase and Dawn Song, have focused on this setting. Specifically, they differentiate through the victim policy to find perturbations like those pictured in the middle, which, when added to observation, is, will cause the policy to take the wrong action. However, this prior work assumes the attacker is able to directly perturb observations of a victim. That made sense in a computer vision context where you can maybe upload a different image to an API, but it's not quite, quite as reasonable an assumption in something like an embodied robotics context or a self-driving car. So let's look at a threat model used in prior work in a bit more detail. In prior work, victim policy is trained in an environment without any adversaries. The agent takes actions, receiving observations and reward from the environment. This is a standard partially observable mark of decision process or POMDP. At attack time, an adversary is introduced. This adversary sees the original observation from the environment and can add a small LP norm modification to it. The perturbed observation is then input to the victim. Typically, the victim is white box, but black box attacks have also had some success. So we take inspiration from this prior work, but believe there are two key deficiencies. Most seriously, it assumes the attacker has the ability to directly modify the observations of a victim. This is usually not possible unless the attacker has very low level control over your system. But in that case, the attacker can exploit you in much simpler ways. Additionally, the resulting perturbed observations are not physically realistic in most of the time. So it's not enough for a victim to generalize to be robust to these attacks. It also has a transfer to impossible scenarios, which is a much stronger requirement. So we propose a novel and more realistic threat model for adversarial examples. Our key insight is that real-world RL agents inhabit natural environments populated by other agents, including humans. These other agents can only modify observations indirectly by their actions. So we therefore focus on competitive multi-agent environments. The victim is trained by a soft play to win against an opponent. And at attack time, we simply substitute the opponent the victim was trained against with an adversary. 
Critically, this adversary doesn't have any special powers. It can only take the same set of actions that the original opponent could have done. This is true as for observations the victim receives are physically realizable in the training environment. We do allow our adversary to train against a fixed black box victim policy. We believe the use of fixed victim policies reflect what's likely to be a common use case. If you have a safety critical system, uh, like a self-driving car, you're probably not going to have it be continually making radical updates to its policy while it's deployed because any, any safety assurances you got for our testing might not hold um, in, in the real world after it's changed. Uh, so even when the victim is not fixed, uh, you can still often train against a fixed proxy victim and then transfer to the target. So since the victim is fixed, it's natural to embed the victim in the environment, treating it as a single agent environment. As the attacker is only given black box access to a victim, the dynamics of the embedded environment will be unknown, even if the dynamics of underlying environment are not. We therefore formulate the attacker's goal as solving a reinforcement learning problem in this embedded environment. We attack the victim using proximal policy optimization, which is a standard model-free deep reinforcement learning algorithm. We evaluate in free multi-agent environments from I'm Bansel sorry, and... Can I ask a question? Sure, of course. Um, and you're, I'm trying to understand like the, your general, um, mm -hmm. the general framework still. So your adversary, from yep. what I understood, is a RL policy too. But what's the action space that it has? Like, is it what does it change? Is it changing the world? Uh, sure. So the, the idea is that both the adversary and the victim are kind of embodied agents in this world. And we're actually considering a fairly symmetric case where they, they have the same body, but they, in general, they don't have to be. So uh, the, in this case, what the, or in the case where we, have, we evaluate in, what the adversary is doing is just moving its body. And this causes the victim to see something different than it otherwise would have done. Uh, like, you know, if you walk in front of someone, they're going to see a different set of pixels if you hadn't walked in front of them. But you don't, you can't just do arbitrary things. So you can't conjure a wall out of thin air. You can't add a particular like white noise pattern to a victim's observations. You can only so do things that are physical. it's just another agent of similar or even dissimilar. But then how yep. is that different from like other ideas of like multiplayer games or self-play and so on that people were already like exploring in our Yeah, yeah. So um, the, the interesting thing is that the policies that we are attacking, they were trained via self-play. Uh, and I, I think that a lot of people, by, by no means everyone, um, but a lot of people in the multi-agent community thought, well, self-play, if you give it enough training, um, is going to produce really strong policies. Because look, we've got AlphaGo, that was self-play, that beat a professional Go player. Uh, we've had OpenAFI, that beat professional Dota players. So it seems like it works really well. Um, but what, what we found um, is that even pretty capable uh, self-play policies can be trivially exploited using only a fraction of amount of training time used to, to produce that self-play policy. But self-play was like a particular example because the, both of the agents are working towards one common goal. But in your case, the adversary is not working towards the same goal of the main order policy, but just to destruct it, right? Well, well self-play is often used in a, a zero-sum game. So you have but both agents want to win and they can only win if other agent loses. Uh, and, and so in this case, there's a sense in which the, the goal of the adversary isn't any different to the goal of a self-play opponent. Um, they're just approaching it differently. And, and the key difference being that in self-play, you kind of, you grow up together, you train together, um, and they're continually responding to each other's changes in policy. Whereas in this case, we, uh, you know, we have this already trained policy and then we just, pluck a brand new opponent um, and train it from scratch. So there's one sense in which you should think this is harder because the adversary doesn't have a benefit of a curriculum that you'd get in self-play. And also we're training it for only a small fraction of a time. But if you think self-play only explores a small set of possible strategies, then it's not so surprising that it's gonna be vulnerable to this kind of completely unseen brand new policy. So your adversary is attacking an already trained and frozen RL policy? Uh, yeah, that's right. We'll, we'll actually see a bit later on mm -hmm. when we relax that and when we, we train both of them, uh, what, what happens. But yeah, the assumption of this attack is that we, we have a policy, you know, maybe you've released this policy into some consumer product and some attacker has got this product and is now just going to train against it. Um, and then 
once it's trained against that it can attack kind of every instance of its copied policy, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, yeah. A any other questions about the, the like general framing and setting? Okay, I'll, I'll move on, but uh, yeah, please do interrupt if anything is, is unclear or you just disagree with anything I say. It's great to have a discussion. Uh, so yeah, we evaluate in free multi-agent environments from Bensel and others. Uh, we chose these environments due to their complexity and competitive nature. All of them are zero-sum games uh, using the Mojoku robotic simulator. And both agents receive proprioceptive observations of their own joint position, velocity, and contact force. And they additionally observe a position of their opponent's tricks. In kick and defend, the kicker is trying to score a penalty kick in football, defended by the goalie. In you should not pass, the runner tries to cross the finish line, while the blocker tries to stop him. And in sumo, two wrestlers each seek to knock the other out. We attack state-of-art policies from Bansal and others agency, which were trained by self-play for over 500 million time steps. We train our adversary for only 20 million time steps. So this is less than 3% of the time steps of the policies we were training against were trained with. Despite this, our adversary, which is uh, the blue line, outperforms the normal zoo opponent, which is this yellow horizontal line, uh, against the zoo victim policy in both kick and defend and usual pass. And it does you know, pretty pretty well on seam humans, although it's not quite as strong. The shaded blue region shows the minimum and maximum across five random seats. This is a Fairly typical level of variance for deep rel, unfortunately. And in use not pass, even the worst seed outperforms the baseline. These results are all reported against the median zoo victim policy, because we've got uh, different policies trained with different seats. Uh, we report on the full set of policies in the paper. Now, it's not perhaps not surprising that we're able to beat a fixed opponent that we can train against. It's kind of helpless, it can't respond to, to what we're doing. What's important, I think, is the way in which the adversarial policies learn to beat the opponent. So they don't learn to perform the intended task really well, like blocking the goal, but instead learn to exploit certain weaknesses in the victim's policy. Here we have two normal agents playing in a simulated robotics environment. The runner, actually, how, how well can you, people see these videos under Zoom? I think there's an option I can take to make them video quality better, but everything else worse. I don't know if that improved. I think it, it just anyone? degraded. Um, okay. <laughs> I think the previous one actually was pretty good. It was just smooth enough. At least okay, I will untick for optimize for the video clip option then. Um, so yeah, here for, uh, but yeah, let me know if anything anything can't be seen. So here for runner in blue is trying to cross the red finish line, while the red blocker is trying to tackle the runner, and it, it succeeds in around forty seven percent of cases. So now we're going to look at the same runner this time playing against an adversarial blocker. Now, if the adversary doesn't stand up, instead it curls into a ball with some of its limbs sticking out. So it's not physically interfering with the victim in any way, but the resulting observation that the victim sees that the red guy is in this weird position causes the victim to fall over or throw itself to the ground. And this adversarial blocker wins 86% of the time, which is much more often than a normal blocker. We see a similar pattern in kick and defense. Here, a normal goalie in red is defending against a normal kicker in blue in a soccer penalty shootout. Now, agents might not be ready for a World Cup, but they're unmistakably playing football. Now, let's look what happens when we introduce an adversary. This adversarial goalie doesn't stand up or make any attempt to move to block the ball. Instead, it places its limbs in a contorted position. This causes the kicker to rarely touch the ball, and sometimes it even falls over. As a consequence, the adversary goalie wins more often than the normal goalie, despite not blocking the ball. Here we have two normal sumo wrestling agents. You can see they're both trying to knock our agent over. By contrast, the adversarial policy learns to kneel in a stable position. It doesn't try to knock the victim over. The victim often falls over while tackling the adversary, and sometimes will fall over or throw itself out of the arena without even touching the adversary. Uh, so we've shown. Is, yeah. Can I ask a question? Of course. Uh, so how, how how did you train both models? Was it the uh, the sale the self play or what you said go like go, or they were trained individually the two agents? Um. So how how do we train like the adversary and the the normal opponent, or how do we train mm, the adversary and the victim? No, for the both normals, the normal. Oh agent. yeah. So yeah. so these the, the both normal ones were actually using 
pre-trained policies or released by the, the team that created these environments. Um, we did that for two reasons. One was that the training was extremely computationally expensive. They trained for up to 2 billion time steps on OpenAI's cluster. And we didn't really want to have to redo that. Uh, the other reason is it sort of felt like it's better in the sense that there's no tricks up our sleeve if we're just using a pre-trained policy. Whereas if we train the policies ourselves, we'd be worried that um, you know maybe we just made a really bad baseline policy and that's where we can attack them. In terms of how they trained them, it was self-play with a sparse zero-sum reward. They did have a dense reward, I think, for the first quarter of training, but it was annealed over time. Um, and it was like fairly off standard off the shelf uh, PPO. Uh, just scaled up okay, and and then for the adversary uh you froze the other agent and then uh, it's like a, se a self-play game right yeah so we, we froze the other agent and then trained it in ba basically the same way as the uh policies were trained by a self-play uh only we're, we're not alternating the training uh because one of the agents is, is fixed but it was using the same rl algorithm ppo the same reward function. Um, so there wasn't any kind of like extra inductive bias on magic here. OK, thank you. OK. okay. Uh, so yeah, we've shown that adversarial policies can beat most victims, and they do so in a perhaps surprising way. But why do the adversarial policies win? So we conducted two experiments analyzing the activations of a victim policy using density modeling and t -SNAP. But first, our policies win without physically interacting with victims. Instead, the actions indirectly change the observations that a victim sees. But why do these observations cause a victim to malfunction? To investigate this, we recorded activations of each victim's policy network while playing against both normal zoo opponents, a random opponent, and an adversarial opponent. We then fed a Gaussian mixture model to activations of a victim when playing against a normal opponent. We used this model to predict how unlikely the activations induced by other opponents were to have occurred naturally if it were to be playing against a normal opponent. Specifically, we plot the mean log probability for activations against various opponents. So higher values are more likely and intuitively are closer to the training distribution. The activations in use by the adversary, shown in blue, are consistently the least likely. But a random baseline, RAND, in green, is only slightly more probable. This suggests that although the adversarial policies do induce activations that are off distribution, this alone isn't sufficient to explain their performance because the random baseline doesn't do very well in most of the environments. We also use TSNE to visualize activations of a victim's policy network. This model was fitted with activations from three opponent types, the adversary in blue, a normal zoo opponent in orange, and the random baseline in green. Uh, so we see that the adversary induces policy activations, uh, this is in kick and defend, uh, that are distinct from those of normal zoo opponents or random opponents. So it basically forms like a completely distinct cluster uh, compared to the others, whereas random is kind of mixed in with everything else, which kind of makes sense because random does take every action with some non-zero probability. Uh, so it makes sense that it kind of covers the space. Sorry, Adam, what are you what are you testing here? Are these uh, like the features of the observation? Uh, these, yeah, these are the every activation at every layer except like the very first and the very last of the victim's policy network so these would be visual embeddings well, well not visual embeddings is no it's not from vision but the, the equivalent of those embeddings and every layer like all of them um all of them together yeah i'm not sure this was the best thing to have done we we didn't really know what layer was most important so we just concatenated them all um but there is a risk that this means that part of it is just clustering whether the observations look normal or not. Uh, so it might be worth us rerunning re -running it. Do you have a sense of a particular layer that's likely to be especially important? Well, I'm not, I don't think we can answer that question quite concretely, but I think it doesn't make sense to mix multiple layers at the same time because um, like you have two different layers. Let's say you have one information, one of them is represented in one layer, the other one is the other network is representing the same exact information. There's some sense of like permutation variance that would be completely irrelevant for the policy, but your TS thing plot will be casting, right? So, like, from if, if I understood correctly, each let's say um, observation 
is contributing multiple dots here, or it's one huge concatenation? Oh, of your oh, uh, no! Every observation, every frame contributes a single dot. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Mm. I mean, okay. I mean, I think the, the like the, the bigger that vector goes, like the value of this thing actually still reduces. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. This is like try and error usually listening, but uh, yeah, I guess like usually it's like the usual thing is like the, the later, probably the more abstract and observable, yeah. like the sem semantic information. But the fact that your orange and red, uh, sorry, orange and green, where mm -hmm. green is random, are actually looking similar. I think that has something to do with the with sampling in this like very high dimensional space because mm -hmm. Like there's no uniform. Like you would expect all this random to have some sort, some sense of like being uniform, right? And yeah. It is not here. So these are, okay. Anyway, I don't want to. Well, like, it, yeah. I mean, I guess the the observations of random policy are not going to be uniform because um, it will very very unlikely to have the humanoid robot stand up if it has exactly. random control. So observations are probably going to be like quite tightly clustered still. Um, but visually, I'd say random actually looks closer to the adversarial policy than it does to the um, to the normal opponent. So it's kind of from that perspective, I'd have expected mm -hmm. random to be intermixed with adversarial. Um, but yeah, this is an interesting point. It sounds like we should probably rerun this with a few different layers um, and just see if it but it changes qualitatively. And what what is this? What do you call zoo here again? Can oh, you... um, zoo is just like the normal uh, self play opponent. We I call see. it zoo because it was. Uh, extracted from Bansal's zoo. agent zoo, um, but it's just a normal opponent. But isn't it unusual to you that the zoo and random are looking similar? Yeah, I I mean, the, the optimistic interpretation of this is that the adversary is being trained effectively to exploit the victim. And the way it does that is by inducing really unusual activations in the victim. So there's a few features which are not actually that important, um, like they're not robust features. If an adversary learns to exploit them, they can push the victim's activations into a very strange space, whereas just a random control policy won't do that. But it does seem, but there's also an interpretation that, yeah, may maybe this is just some kind of artifact of uh, how, how we're doing TSNI. Um, again, just to make sure I understand, these are sure. activations, TSNI is activations of a victim policy. Uh, of a victim, that's right, yeah. So it's the same victim policy playing against mm -hmm. three different opponents. I see. Well, that changes a little bit because it seems like then Rand mm, managed to, and Zoo is without. Oh no, Zoo is still is like playing against an adversary, right? Yeah. So Zoo is Zoo is trained against this victim. They they like reach some kind of self play equilibrium. I see. I see. Okay, yeah, I think just the fact that the observation depends on like how a policy is being attacked, I think mm -hmm. it makes interpretation a little difficult because it can just change the yeah. observation that is receiving, not right. necessarily it's changing the activation in some way that, I mean, it, yep. it actually can't do any change to the activation, right? The way it can change the activation is change the observation, right? Yeah, yeah. I guess what we might care about is if there are small changes in the observation or small changes in the, the opponent policy that cause big changes in the activation. So maybe mm -hmm. the way to explore this would be to do something like take the adversary and add increasing amounts of random noise to its actions until its win rate declines. Then we can say this is a baseline that looks similar to the adversary, but is clearly doing something very different to the victim. And then we could maybe tease new those two. Mm -hmm. And do you know if the models in Zoo were trained with some randomization? Was there any robustness involved in training them or no? Um, they, there was no explicit attempt to make them robust above and beyond what self-play would normally give you. Mm -hmm. um, they did do a fair amount of evaluation showing that the policies were robust to kind of normal kinds of distribution shifts. They trained depending on the environment, up to three different uh, copies of the victim and opponent, so just with different seeds. And they played them against each other when they hadn't previously played them uh, you know, against that, that opponent. And it transferred pretty well. So a normal victim playing against a different normal opponent still transfers quite well. They also uh, tested basically like a random force vector. 
uh, in sumo. So you just, God's hand is suddenly tugging at your center of mass. Um, and we found that the agents were still able to withstand that until you made the force vector quite large. So these, these aren't completely fragile policies, but they didn't do any kind of attempt to make them robust to this particular kind of attack. How does exactly like then self-play when then you have two different roles in the game work? What does that what does oh, self-play mean? Yeah, so, so it, okay, so I'll note that in sumo it is actually symmetric. Um, but you're right that in all of the other environments it's an asymmetric game. So they just have two different agents, which with different random initializations, different neural networks, same architecture of a neural network, same observation space that are playing against each other and you will um, yeah, like train against one for an epoch, update one policy, train against the other for an epoch, update that policy. And, and there's iterate. no sharing between the two going on? There's no parameter sharing? Okay. No, there's, there's so no there's way two sharing. policies effectively. Yeah. And, and you, okay, how do you, when you say you are attacking that, then is then you choose one of the two mm -hmm. and then, right? Like which yeah. policy, do you, how do you know which policy to pick to attack? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great question. So we, we did, I mean, again, in Sumo it's symmetric, but in the others we did have a choice and we picked the one which we thought was gonna be more vulnerable to attack. Uh, I think mm -hmm. the key thing here is how much freedom does the each agent have in its actions? So if you look back at something like, um, yeah, something like uh, you shall not pass or kick and defend. So the runner has to cross the finish line. Otherwise it loses, otherwise the blocker wins. Mm -hmm. um, and so if a runner just curled into a ball and made the blocker fall over, it still wouldn't win, even though it's disabled the blocker because it would have to then like pick itself up and cross the finish line. Right. Whereas the blocker, all it has to do is make the runner fail. Uh, mm -hmm. So in some sense, the blocker has an easier task, at least you're doing this kind of adversarial attack. And there's a similar thing with uh, kick and defend. So actually, I, I think in a, yeah, in, in kick and defend, just for the zero policy, <laughs> that, that's this red dashed line that does nothing, just falls over still wins about 50% of the time because sometimes the kicker just fails to kick the ball. It's not that good at playing football. So in, in that sense, we're starting from like a, a higher baseline uh, as an adversarial policy, because even if it does nothing, it still wins 50% of the time. Whereas if we were doing it the other way around, we'd be starting at 0% and we'd have to be like getting a lot higher up. Um, with that said, I think it, it can work in, it probably can work in both directions, at least in some of these games. Uh, and actually, I'll show later some some more recent work from another team also found adversarial policies in another symmetric game. So it's not just a artifact of these being asymmetric. Yeah, I think it's generally still a bit confusing to me because, like, how how is this different from the following? Like, when in model in the zoo they were training mm -hmm. these agents. Let's say in your case in the um, in the goalie and kicker. Um, let's say if you yep. freeze kicker and just continue doing exactly the same standard policy training that they were doing in Zoom, uh, just freeze yep. one of them. How is yep. it different from what you call adversary here? Oh uh, yeah, okay. So this is this is really important. I should have noted it. So we actually tried um, starting from the zoo opponent and continuing to train it with a frozen victim because we figured this opponent is already really good, so it should help if we start from this already capable policy rather than a random initialized policy. And that didn't work <laughs> at all. It, it just, it basically didn't improve. In fact, in some cases it got worse, probably because we were training with a, a slightly smaller batch size. So, so it was just a uh, gradient noise. Um, and what we think happens is that with self play, it does reach an equilibrium in many cases. It just doesn't necessarily reach a good global equilibrium, but it's reached an equilibrium so if you're playing against this particular opponent, any small changes to your opponent will make that opponent do worse. And any small changes to yourself will make yourself do worse against that opponent. So they're not incentivized to change. Uh, and what we're able to find a new um, opponent that does exploit this by starting from a random initialization, which has no preconception. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, if it's a local like rollover, it's not guaranteed to be robust against things in that space. But there is a sense in which there is a continuum between this and self-play, because you could make you could make a variant of self-play that 
randomly initializes things occasionally and introduces new agents or that trains for longer periods of time. Right. Uh, but is my understanding correct that the only difference between the scenario that I explained and yours is the initialization of the opponent? Um, initialization and when we train for a longer period of time than you typically would in a single epoch of self play. So normally you train, uh, you like do rollouts of both policies and then you update both policies mm -hmm. or you update one policy. And those epochs of, I think, in the, the agents were attacking, that was something like 250,000 time steps. So it's still quite a lot of time, but we're training for 20 million time steps against a fixed victim. So there's a sense in which we can get much, much further away from our starting point, which I think is also important um, if you're trying to break a local equilibria. Thank you. Sorry, very long question. Very yeah, no, no worries. I think it's, it's important to clarify these, these kinds of things. Um, yeah, does anyone else have questions on the, the setup? OK, um, so yeah, let's, let's go on to uh, possible defenses. So since the attack works by inducing natural observations that are adversarial to a victim and not by physically interfering with a victim, we wondered if hiding the adversary from the victim would work as a defense. Specifically, we constructed a masked victim that cannot see the opponent. And this is exactly the same as the original victim, except the portion of the observation consisting of opponent's position is set to a static value. Uh, this corresponds to a typical initial position of the opponent. As an illustrative example, we'll compare the behavior of unmasked and masked victims in Yushnot Pass. Both videos are against an adversarial opponent. On the left is the unmasked victim that we saw previously, and on the right is the masked version. The adversarial opponent wins 86% of the time against the unmasked victim, but only 1% against the masked victim. And this difference is particularly a large in you should not pass, but a similar pattern will hold in the other environments as well. So unfortunately, while masking a victim is an effective defense, it harms performance against normal opponents. Here, both videos are against a normal opponent, and the unmasked victim on the left wins 52% of the time, but the masked victim that cannot see the opponent coming loses 78% of the time. Our most sophisticated defense is to fine tune the victim policy against the adversary. So in a sense, this is kind of a continuation of self-play training, but with a much larger training epoch. Uh, so we tried fine tuning for 20 million time steps, which is the same amount of time used to train the adversary to prevent catastrophic forgetting half of episodes are played against the, the frozen normal opponent and the other half the adversary. Once you have this defense works in, you should not pass. On the left, the adversary is playing a normal opponent, while on the right, the adversary is playing a hardened victim that has been fine-tuned against the adversary. The hardened victim is clearly far more robust. It wins 89% of the time, whereas the normal victim won only 14% of episodes. Although fine-tuning defense against this particular adversarial policy, we can repeat the attack method to obtain a new adversarial policy. Here we see an adversarial policy trained against a hardened victim, playing against a normal victim on the left and a hardened victim on the right. This new adversarial policy achieves high win rates against both the normal and hardened victims. But note, it does say by tripping the victim up, which is a much more reasonable failure mode. So to recap, there's four key takeaways from the material presented so far. First, real-world attacks against IR systems will come from malicious agents acting in a shared environment. So we should study attacks under a multi-agent threat model. Second, attacks under this more challenging threat model are possible. Even policies that are highly capable against normal opponents can fail in the presence of adversarial agents. Third, adversarial policies win by creating natural observations that are adversarial to the victim. Finally, adversarial training should use promise as a defense method. Um, I've got some kind of extra bonus material on future ex extensions and some recent related work that I can go through if we have time. But I think here is probably a good time to pause for questions before we dive into any of that. And then we can just see if we have time. I think people are curious about the future work. So maybe I'll let you, I'll let you continue if there are no other questions. And then we can ask all the questions uh, at the end. Uh, all right, sounds good. And we've got until the, the hour. Is that it? Well, yes. I mean, but that's also dependent on you. I mean, if you. Right. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, Adam, how, how long do you think the future work will take? Um, I'd guess five to 10 minutes. 
depending yeah, on sure. how many questions there are. I mean, do you want to finish that and then do a little bit of discussion? I mean, you're in Berkeley too, so I think you celebrate these interruptions and discussions if... Um... Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to just, I just wrap it up. I just want to make sure that we had time if there were a lot of pending questions, but it sounds like uh, probably people have mostly been asking the most pressing questions as we've been going along. So I think we can press on. All right, uh, can everyone see my screen again? Yes. Okay, great. So one interesting question is, can we develop a better attack? For example, achieving a higher win rate or being more sample efficient. So to recap, our attack just embeds the fixed victim in the environment and then trains an adversary using an off-the-shelf model-free RL algorithm. We actually originally intended this attack to be a baseline, but it turned out that it works pretty well. So we didn't really feel the need to improve on it in the original paper. But it really should be possible to do better. Uh, and yeah, recent work by Xian Wu and others proposes exactly such an improvement. In particular, they augment the standard PPA loss with an auxiliary loss term. This auxiliary loss incentivizes the adversary to take actions that cause the victim to change its actions while minimizing the changes to the victim's observations. So the idea is the adversary wants to make a small change to its policy, which will cause a big change in how a victim behaves. Specifically, they learn a differentiable model of the environment. And then for each policy gradient step, estimate what observation O hat the victim would see were it to have played against an adversary with parameters theta rather than the adversary's current parameters. We also estimate the victim's action in this case, A hat. The goal is to maximize the difference in this estimated action and minimize the difference in the estimated observation. They evaluate in Robo School Pong. This is a simulated robotics task where players control a paddle playing Pong. It's very, very low dimensional uh, compared to our environments. It has only 13 dimensional observations and two dimensional actions per player. So you can see the victim on the left uh, misses the ball, even though the adversary doesn't really seem to be doing anything particularly unusual. So I think it's really interesting that we can attack the victim in this way, even when you only have a two dimensional action space, you can just move on a plane. Uh, by contrast, the humanoid environments we evaluated in had 24 dimensional action spaces, which give the attacker a lot more freedom. They also give training curves. So more confusingly, the curve labeled ours is not ours, it is theirs. Uh, the curve labeled baseline is our method, so just standard PPO. Their method seems to be clearly more sample efficient, uh, for one using for auxiliary loss. But standard PPO actually holds up pretty well getting to around a 90% win rate against a victim. And it looks to me like it would probably have improved even further if it given it a bit more time. So I find it exciting that we can do better than standard PPO, but I think there's also probably a lot more ideas for attacks that have yet to be explored. And I also find it really interesting that it's possible to mount attacks even in relatively simple environments, which is a bit of a bad news from a security perspective, because it probably means that the problem is more broad than we previously thought. Another interesting direction is to better understand why soft play produces policies that are vulnerable to this kind of attack. Notably, if the learned victim and opponent policy are in Nash equilibrium of each other, then an adversarial cannot possibly do any better than the normal opponent policy. Yet our adversarial policies often do achieve much higher win rates than normal opponents, despite only being trained for a small fraction of the time. So this shows that even after billions of time steps of soft play training, uh, it still hasn't converged to Nash. One plausible reason for this is that self-play requires games be transitive, meaning if policy A beats policy B beats policy C, then policy A has to be policy C. If this isn't true in a game like Rock, Paper, Scissors, then self-play can just go in a cycle without ever improving. In fact, we've already seen that policies in environments are not always transitive. So we have that a masked victim beats an adversarial opponent, but an adversarial opponent beats a normal victim, which beats a normal or self-play opponent which in turn beats the mass victim. So this gives a loop. It's tempting, I think, to conclude from this, you know, okay, we've found the problem. The environments we evaluated in aren't transitive. This breaks the assumption of self-play, so we shouldn't expect self-play to work. But this is a little unsatisfying because many, possibly most tasks, exhibit non-transitivity, yet self-play empirically works pretty well. So what's going on here? One possible explanation is given by Wojciech, Czarnecki, and others in a recent paper, Real World Games Look Like Spinning Tops. Their conjecture is that for many games, especially those designed to be enjoyable for humans to play, like Go or Chess, 
They gained exhibit both an element of skill indicated by the vertical axis. Uh, but also a diversity of qualitatively different strategies at a given skill level, which is indicated by the radial axis. And intuitively, this makes sense because if everyone at your skill level played exactly the same strategy, it would kind of be a really boring game to learn. But if there was no way of getting better at the game over time, then it would also be a really <laughs> demotivating game to play. Um, so there's something like rock, paper, scissors, where you, there's not really a skill dimension. Uh, so in, in these games, soft play can work pretty well it might cycle around the radial axis, but it will still make progress along the vertical axis. Under this picture, we'd expect adversarial policies to be easy to find against low skill policies, where the radial axis is quite large, but will become increasingly rare as opponent skill increases. Eventually, once a Nash equilibrium is reached, it would be impossible to find. However, it's unclear whether self-play ever reaches a Nash equilibrium in practice, except in some trivial games. So one way to answer this question would be to try and form an adversarial attack against state-of-the-art soft play systems like Alpha Zero or Open AI 5. This is a direction we'd be like to work on in the future. It does seem a little tricky to even replicate some of his uh, state-of-the-art results, um, but I'd be happy to chat more about this if anyone is interested in pursuing it. Another question is whether real-world tasks follow this spinning top pattern or if it's just limited to artificially designed games. This is first, I'm also interested in exploring the degree to which policies in realistic tasks are vulnerable to adversarial policies. I think this is especially important for safety critical tasks like autonomous driving. Um, my guess is that if you were to use deep RL for autonomous driving, it probably is going to be vulnerable to this. I'm much less sure about whether a you know explicit stack where you have perception control planning, especially if you have sensor fusion, whether that's going to be vulnerable. Uh, but I think it'd be interesting to actually test that empirically. It's also important to work on defenses to adversarial attack. Uh, so notably, self-play was inspired by fictitious play, which is an algorithm from game theory based on each agent iteratively choosing the best response to the opponent's policy. But self-play, by contrast, trains each agent for a short period of time which doesn't allow it to converge to a best response to the opponent. So it's particularly likely to find local rather than global equilibria. Now, naively, we could just increase the number of time steps in each self-play epoch to better approximate best response. But this becomes prohibitively expensive. Self-play is already quite a computationally expensive procedure. A collaborator of mine, Sergey Volodin, has developed an approach that instead slowly increases the number of time steps in each self-play epoch. This starts to algorithm learn quickly initially with many small but frequent epochs, but in a limit still closely approximates the iterated best response. So this figure, the victim is in orange, a pre-trained normal opponent is in blue, and an adversary is in green. When the background of the figure is green, it's a bit difficult to see at first, but it's easier to see towards the right, then we're training the green adversary when the background is green. When the background is orange, we're training the orange victim. And the blue we, opponent, we just don't update at all, it's fixed. And we see that initially, uh, the reward of adversary in green increases very rapidly. But it, the victim quickly recovers. And after a while, the reward stabilizes. Now, I expect the, the victim could still be attacked if you were to hold it fixed and train against it for long enough. But this suggests that the method of alternating training at least increases robustness. So the attacker would have to expend more computational resources to find a vulnerability. So if you're Google and you can train on your huge cluster and you just want to protect against some script kitty with your laptop, maybe this defense is pretty good. Uh, if you're Google and you want to protect against a nation state, this probably isn't going to be enough because they can muster similar amounts of computational resources to you. But this is just one possible defense method. There's other promising directions like increasing the diversity of opponents seen during training. Uh, for example, using population-based training. Or you could implement anomaly detection to work out if you're playing against an adversary. And then you could either fall back to some kind of conservative policy, or at least let someone know that it is a problem, and you can investigate it further. So for more information, uh, check out our paper. Uh, we also have a website, adversarialpolicies.github.io, which contains a complete set of demonstration videos and a link to our source code. Uh, so thanks, and I'm now excited to take some questions.